Okay, well, I want to th thank John for that lovely introduction and thank uh, John and Matt for inviting me to give this talk. Okay, the talk has an introduction and then there are two parts. So here goes the introduction. I was asked to talk about mathematics and culture and what I want to show you all today is that geometry historically has been a leading actor in the history of thought and culture. To begin, all right, wish me luck with this device. Every mathematician has some sort of relationship with Euclid, photographed from life. Uh, why is Euclid so special? Sorry? Oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. Uh, why is Euclid so special? I claim that when we use words like truth and proof, what we're doing is channeling Euclid. For 2,000 years, Euclid's geometry seemed to prove truths about geometrical objects and thereby to achieve certainty. Aristotle, he's earlier than Euclid, Aristotle said, the truth and certainty of geometry comes from how it's put together, using logical deductions from explicit assumptions and clear definitions. Euclid probably looked over his shoulder at Aristotle's criteria when he was writing the elements of geometry. And it's not just the ancient world. Many important later thinkers believed that other subjects might come to share the certainty of geometry if only they followed the same method. For instance, Descartes said, you know, if we start with self-evident truths and then we proceed by logical deduction, more and more complex truths, why there's nothing we couldn't come to know. Spinoza wrote a book called Ethics Demonstrated in Geometrical Order with explicitly labeled axioms and definitions. I quote one of his theorems, quote, God, where substance consisting of infinite attributes necessarily exists. The proof ends with a QED. <laughs> <laughs> the influence of the Euclidean ideal on science is clear. There's another famous name from Newton's Principia. As you see, Newton called his famous three laws of motion axioms. He deduced even his law of gravity in the form of two theorems. Here's somebody I'm told you know. From, he suggests the Euclidean and Newtonian form for his work. Newton famously said, quote, it's the glory of geometry that from so few principles it can accomplish so much. One more example, the Declaration of Independence of the United States, his author, its author tried to inspire faith in its certainty by using the Euclidean form. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who knew more of the mathematics of his time than any American president or presidential candidate, <laughs> began his argument, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all right angles are equal. No, that's, that's not what he said, but that is what it sounds like. Another self-evident truth in the Declaration is that if any government fails to secure human rights, it's the right of the people to get rid of it and set up a new government. The Declaration asserts that King George's government does not secure these rights, and then it says, quote, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And once the facts have proved this, we have, if P then Q, we prove P, therefore Q, and the actual declaration that founds the United States is stated explicitly as the conclusion of a logical argument, beginning with therefore. You can go over to the National Archive and look it up. We therefore declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. So, in philosophy, theology, science, and politics, the idealized Euclidean model of reasoning has shaped conceptions of proof, truth, and certainty. Okay, that was the introduction. Now for the first half of the actual talk, we'll look together at Euclid's elements, at the idea of Euclidean space, and its wide-ranging influence, and we'll see that it lives up to its press notices. But, we'll also see that there is a problem. And in the second half of this talk, we'll see that the problem, and its resolution, have produced a non-Euclidean world and that this break with the past has had a comparably great impact as the Euclidean model had. So here we go with part one. 
Here are Euclid's postulates, hopefully the minimal set of self-evident truths from which all the true results of geometry can be logically deduced. Postulates 1 through 4 are pretty straightforward. Yeah, all right angles are equal. Don't argue. But look at number 5, Euclid's so-called parallel postulate. It doesn't mention parallels at all. That one's complicated. I think we better draw a picture. Postulate 5 means this. If the two green lines are cut by a third line, such that angle A and angle B add up to less than two right angles, then the two green lines eventually meet on that side. They don't have to be green, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> I ask my students to vote on whether this postulate is self-evident, and they overwhelmingly agree that it isn't. You gotta draw a picture even to understand it, they said. The ancient Greeks agreed with my students. And that is the problem that I mentioned. Well, okay, so if this postulate isn't self-evident, maybe it can be proved from the other postulates. So the Greeks tried to do this. They did not succeed. So did the best mathematicians in the medieval Islamic and Jewish worlds. More photographs from life. <laughs> uh, then mathematicians in Europe, on into the 19th century, they also couldn't prove it. Now, while the Greeks were trying to prove Euclid's fifth postulate, one thing that they proved right at the beginning was that Euclid's postulate is logically equivalent to the uniqueness of parallel lines. I don't need to state that, right? Now, this is a common alternative form of the parallel postulate. It actually has parallels in it, and it's found in many modern textbooks. It was formulated first in the ancient world, and therefore it's called Playfair's axiom after an 18th century guy. That's how things get named. <laughs> now Euclid defined parallel lines as lines in the same plane that never meet. From his first four postulates, he proved that parallel lines can be constructed, therefore they exist, but he needs the fifth postulate for his proof of a key theorem in his elements. You will remember this one from high school. If two lines are parallel, the alternate interior angles and the corresponding angles are equal, like angle 3 equals angle 6, angle 2 equals angle 6. This key theorem is what Euclid needs to prove not only the uniqueness of parallels, but many other theorems that involve parallel lines. For instance, that they are everywhere equidistant, or the sum of the angles of a triangle is two right angles. Now, Euclid himself doesn't talk about space. But, especially starting in the Renaissance, people talk a lot about space. An infinite, homogeneous space that's the same in all directions and where every point is just like every other point. That's the space that Euclid's geometry happens in. And the role of philosophy in describing this space is just enormous. So, where do you get the idea that space is the same in all directions? It comes from something called the principle of sufficient reason. This sounds trivial. For everything that is, there's a reason why it must be as it is and not otherwise. Principles at least as old as Archimedes, I give an illustration. A lever with equal weights at equal distances from the fulcrum balances. Why? Why not? <laughs> because there's no reason for the lever to go down on either side and therefore it balances. And sufficient reason is also why space is infinite. Giordano Bruno said in 1600, space must be infinite because there's no reason for it to stop at any particular place. The greatest advocate of the principle of sufficient reason was Leibniz. Leibniz said it's the principle of sufficient reason along with the laws of logic that God used in making the universe. God made the universe optimal in the best possible way like the lights reflect, refracted in the shortest possible time, like that. The simplest laws, it's the most efficient universe. And also, if the principle of sufficient reason is true, then the universe is transparent to reason. God made it rationally, so we human beings can figure it out. You want a real example? Here's a real example. Fifty years before Newton, a couple of people, Descartes, and Pierre Gassendi discovered Newton's first law of motion. And here's how they figured it out. First law of motion says a body in motion 
with no forces acting on it, continues in a straight line at a constant speed. Why? Well, it continues in a straight line because this point's just like this point. Why should it speed up and prefer to be at that point? So constant speed. Why a straight line? Why doesn't it turn to the left or the right? All directions are the same. Why should it turn to the left? Why should it turn to the right? Similar arguments make a body at rest with no forces acting on it stay right where it is. Newton's first law, 50 years earlier. Okay, sufficient reason is a powerful principle. And now we come to my hero, Lagrange. Lagrange decided that he could prove the uniqueness of parallels, which is logically equivalent to Euclid's postulate 5, by using the principle of sufficient reason. So, here's what he's trying to prove. Wait a minute. Who says you can use Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason in a mathematical proof? Lagrange says so. He says, the principle of sufficient reason is just as obvious and true as are the laws of logic. So, now let's see what Lagrange did. It's in a manuscript that I found at the Institute of France, and he read it to the members of the Institute de France, all kinds of famous mathematicians and scientists in Paris in 1806. Given that we have one parallel through point P, suppose there were another parallel, it's a proof by contradiction, suppose there were another parallel through point P. It might look like this. But by the principle of sufficient reason, there's no reason that the new parallel line should be below the point, left, the point P on the left and above the point P on the right. It could equally well be drawn the other way. So, the principle of sufficient reason says there must be another symmetric parallel line that goes the other way, as in this new diagram. Lagrange then repeats the same argument for lines symmetric to his new parallels. So you get a third line on the other side of his new parallel like this. And so on, with lots more. I'll show you Lagrange's own picture of the final situation from his manuscript. <laughs> Which, Lagrange says, is absurd. <laughs> so, he concludes, there can only be one parallel QED. <laughs> now, Lagrange never published this. <laughs> uh, it said that they, they were underwhelmed, the audience uh, at the <laughs> Institute. But, uh, and he didn't publish it, he doesn't say why he didn't publish it, but probably because he came to see that when he used the principle of sufficient reason to produce the first set of new symmetric parallels, he was assuming that the original two parallel lines were everywhere equidistant, and thus assuming the very Euclidean nature of space that he was trying to prove. But the fact that a great mathematician like Lagrange got up in public and linked space being Euclidean with Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason demonstrates how closely linked sufficient reason was with the idea that space necessarily had to be Euclidean. Okay, furthermore, real space for Newton's physics has to be Euclidean. Why? Well, because you're using parallelograms of forces and proving the properties of parallelograms requires Euclid's theory of parallels and therefore postulate 5. Now Leibniz disagreed with Newton about space. See, Newton, for Newton, space had to be real. It was not a fiction, it was not in the head, and it, it had to exist. And the reason it had to exist is so Newton could distinguish real accelerations from apparent accelerations. Why did he want to make that distinction? Because he wanted to argue that gravity was real. Okay, when the planet doesn't go in a straight line and goes around the sun in an ellipse, the reason for that is a real force, real acceleration, real force. Has to be, that acceleration has to be with respect to a real frame of reference, real space. Now Leibniz disagreed with Newton about space. Leibniz says there is no such thing. Space is just the relations between bodies. Okay, big argument, right? Who won? Newton, because Euler took his side. Euler says, the straight line constant speed motion of a single body with no forces acting on it, according to Newton's first law, cannot possibly depend on where other physical bodies just happen to be at some particular time. It's got to be a straight line always, therefore a straight line with respect to something that always exists, namely space. 
So space for Newtonian physics has got to be real and Euclidean. Last question about mathematics. Why did mathematicians of the 18th century care so much about proving Euclid's fifth postulate from the rest? Precisely because it's so important. Not just geometry, all of science rested on it. You really need to know that it's true. Too bad it didn't work out. <laughs> and now to philosophy. A super important influential philosopher, Immanuel Kant, agreed with Newton that space exists and that we order our perceptions in it, but Kant said space exists in our minds and that we each have the same unique space in our minds. But it's going to turn out that for Kant, that space has to be Euclidean. And I want to make that argument for you. Okay? To argue that we can come to know non-trivial truths about non-material things, for those of you into philosophy, that's synthetic a priori judgments. Uh, Kant uses Euclid's proof that the sum of the angles of a triangle is to right angles. You all knew that. Paul Helmholtz used to say you should always prove something in a math talk. I'm going to prove this. <laughs> all right, so we start with a triangle. This is Euclid's proof. To do the proof, first you extend the base to D, and then you construct the line CE parallel to AB, and then you prove the equality of various angles to the angles around C. You know this proof. And so it all adds up to two right angles. But it's not the details of the proof that matter. Kant's key point is this proof cannot work unless and until you make those constructions. All right, 